Okay, so uh, we finished uh, with defining uh, an observable for the for the FK easing model. So I want just to remind that we we go for the domains like, for example, this one, and then there are uh, we split this graph into loops, but because of two distinguished points A and B, besides loops, there will be a curve from A to B. And essentially, our, uh, our observable is the probability that this curve passes through a given H, but it's, it's taken with a complex weight, and the weight is we just go up to this point. And for when we go from B up to this point, we put weight lambda for every left turn. So every left turn nets us lambda, and every right turn nets us lambda bar. And when we arrive here, we get some complex weight, one in this picture. So uh, an, an observation we made yesterday is that uh, the complex weight we get when passing through some h is essentially up to plus minus is independent of trajectory. So this is a particular property of this lambda, and it uses the fact that lambda uh, to the power of 4 is minus 1. So, for example, if we arrive to an H and start then going in cycles, then each time when we make a cycle, we multiply by minus 1. So, uh, and then it's easy to see that uh, since essentially it's independent, then uh, up to plus minus, then it's just determined by some given trajectory. And you can draw a trajectory and see that, uh, well, if this is point B here, then it's 1. And then we turn right, it's lambda bar, turn left, it's lambda. Well, uh, here we cannot get immediately. We have to make it a turn. But that's, then it's sort of periodic in that way. So there was this first property, which is sort of a kind of a phase. So our observable doesn't really put a complex number of every h. It puts a real number on every h times this complex weight. So here it's lambda bar times some real number. Here it's some real number. Here it's i times some real number that is an imaginary number. And uh, then the second property was that if you take uh, edges emanating from some vertex and you label them north, south, west, and east, the second property was that uh, f of west plus f of east is equal to f of north plus f of south. And uh, it turns out that this is actually equivalent uh, if you have the property 1. So this is what I was, I was saying, that it's equivalent to the usual cauchy riemann equation, which would be in our case, uh, what, that i times f of east minus f of west give, uh, gives us f of north minus f of south. Okay, so let's, let's, let's just prove it. Uh, uh, so first, uh, first I, I make an observation that, uh, well, f uh, east, north, west, and south, the numbers which we have here, they are proportional to i, 1, lambda, and lambda bar. So essentially, the property 2, so proof, so to say, what does the property 2 say? The property to say is that uh, some real number, let's say, denoted where it's small. So, uh, I mean, without loss of generality, you can say that the weights here are 1, uh, what is it, lambda bar, i, and lambda, be all, because otherwise it's just some rotation of this picture, so it doesn't really change a thing. You just multiply by something. So, uh, so essentially, you can rewrite f of west plus f of east being equal to f of north plus f of south as some real number west times i plus some real number east uh, uh, equal to some real number times lambda bar plus some real number times lambda. And essentially what it means that, well, we have some complex number and on the left we write it in the basis of 1 and i and on the right we write it in the basis of lambda and lambda bar. So essentially it means that we have some complex number, and uh, what we have written on these four edges are four projections of this complex number on four different lines. So this is, uh, so, so uh, conclusion, there is a complex number, 
which we can call, uh, let's say, f of z, where z is this vertex. So if I denote by z this vertex, we can call it f of z. Uh, and uh, f of west, f of east, etc., are its projections are its projections, orthogonal projections on the vectors of west on i, 1, lambda bar, and lambda. Uh, so this, this actually, yeah, maybe before we prove 3, I... I want to make remark because this this will be this gives another way to reformulate this identity and this is the way how it a similar identity for a similar observable will arise in the spin easing. Uh, so if we pass uh, uh, if we pass uh, from our uh, from our function on edges to function defined on vertices in that way that at a vertex we put a number whose projections are written on edges. Then we can reformulate our identity saying that if we take two nearby edges, they have two complex numbers whose projections on lambda coincide, or on lambda bar, or on one, depending on what, what kind of edge it is. So this is, this is another, uh, another uh, way to, to sort of formulate this thing that, uh, so reformulation, so let's say property four, reformulation, reformulation of F. So can, we can define f on vertices. And then the Kashirian equation states that if we take two nearby vertices, let's say z and u, and then there is some number written on this h. It can be 1 or i if the h is horizontal, or lambda or lambda bar if the h is vertical. So there is some number, let's say alpha. And then the Kashirian equation is that the projection of f of u on alpha is the same as projection of f of z on alpha. So for example, if the number one is here, then we have two complex numbers who have the same real part. If the number i is here, they have same imaginary part. Here they have same projection on lambda. And uh, it's it would mean that there is a complex number of every vertex, and there is a real relation for every edge. So there are approximately the same number of relations as, as, as the unknowns. OK, so this is, this is yet another reformulation. Is it OK that we can reformulate it like that? Another way to, do, to define our function on vertex is, is just take the same definition with probability to pass and put it uh, and cut it not at the edge, but at the vertex. And the only adjustment one has to make is that through a vertex you have, can pass in principle twice, and then you should count both passages. So that's the only chance you, change you have to make. And then, then you would get a function which has this relation, but it's a bit, a little epsilon more awkward to check it. OK. So now, uh, why this relation is, why number two is equivalent to number three? Uh, well, uh, Look, this was number two. And it says that some complex number is equal to some other complex number. Well, to the same complex number. So if they are equal, their complex conjugates are equal. So let's put bar on top. So it's, it's the same as saying that minus omega e plus e. So we put complex conjugate on the left. And here, when we put complex conjugate, it will be two bars here and lambda bar bar plus s lambda bar. So it is these two bars they cancel out as they do. So what does it mean in terms of f west, east, north, and south? Well, in terms of f west, east, north, and south, the first one means just that we have written f of west minus f of west plus f of east. And instead of n lambda, we have n lambda bar, we have n lambda. 
So what is the relation between lambda and lambda bar? Well, lambda happens to be, uh, so if this is the vector lambda, then this is the vector lambda bar. So the vector lambda bar is lambda multiplied by i. So if, if you compare these two things, then uh, lambda is lambda bar multiplied by minus i. So it's minus i f of north. And here lambda bar is lambda multiplied by i, so it's plus i f of south. And I believe that, uh, yeah, I got, uh, yeah, I think it's what is written there up to multipl multiplication by, by some number. Probably it's what is written there multiplied by i. So if, if, I, multi yeah, if I multiply by i, then I get uh, i times f of east minus f of west is equal to uh, i times i is minus 1. So it's f of north minus f of south. Yeah, OK, so this is the second property. So in, 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 in principle, uh, what happens for the Ising model is that, uh, uh, well, because so uh, for, uh, for, for another model, for another model, as I said, we can tweak lambda so that this property will be satisfied. Or a more correct thing would be to tweak lambda so that the property 3 is satisfied. But we can tweak it so that both are satisfied. Either we, we can only choose one of them. So for another model, we can only get one of these two properties. And we can get another from number 1, because there is lambda to the power 4 is not 1. So for other models, essentially, we would get a number on every edge. And we would get a relation for every vertex, either relation 2 or relation 3. So for other models, we get less relations than there are unknowns. So if, if we would know, for example, our observable on the boundary, if it's inside, if inside there are million edges, inside there are only 500,000 vertices. So we get less relations by half. So we won't be able to reconstruct our observable. So this is the problem with other models. On the other hand, with the easing, we have two relations, 2 and 3. So if there are million edges inside, we have 500,000 vertices, but each vertex has two relations. So we, we, we can, in principle, reconstruct unless these relations are linearly dependent, and they, they actually they are not. So this is the problem for other models. So if one wants to address other models uh, by some exact relation, one needs to find either one more relation by some way, or one needs to project uh, and study not f, but some sums of f where you lose some information, but you gain relations. Or one needs to find another observable. So I don't know. So my, my impression that is this exact observable for other values of q uh, doesn't have another exact relation. So Maybe it has approximate relations. So this is, maybe we can discuss tomorrow a bit. OK. And this number three, it's, it's, exactly, it's exactly Cauchy Riemann relation. But you see, it's Cauchy Riemann relation if, if, uh, if our function was defined on the edges. If our function is defined on the edges, so it's defined at those yellow points. So it's like it, de it is defined on the vertices of the yellow graph, the so-called medial lattice. But then what we have, we only have relation for those plackets which, which cover a vertex. So we have a discrete analytic function, but cauchy riemann relation only for half of the plackets. So this is, this is why for other models it doesn't work. And for easing it sort of works because we have relations only for half of the plackets, but we have double relations. So this is an answer to not yet asked question, what is wrong? No, it was asked yesterday, what is wrong with other models? So what, no, 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 what is wrong for, with our proof for other models? OK, questions? Is it clear? OK. Now, uh, so, we, so I, I hope I convinced you that the function is discrete analytic, because, uh, well, for example, we've rewritten it. So this is certainly a cauchy riemann equation. Or you can also, uh, you can actually check that, for example, function at vertices defined uh, in this funny way. If you take function at vertices in this funny way and you take 
four vertices nearby, then it's good exercise to check that it indeed satisfies Cauchy Riemann relation. So we won't need it, we won't use it, we will, we will be able to prove everything without it, but it actually is a function on the vertices satisfies the usual Cauchy Riemann relation, so everything is fine. Now, so the function is uh, analytic inside, discrete uh, holomorphic inside. So now uh, we want to pass to a limit, so we want to determine what this function is. And to this effect, we would need to know boundary conditions. So the question is, what can we say about our function on the boundary? Here, the situation is a bit more complicated than for uniform spanning tree, where the function on the boundary clearly had uh, zero real part or zero imaginary part. So here it's slightly more difficult as a condition. So this is the next observation. Um, okay, let's say boundary condition. Uh, so, uh, so if we have, uh, so I, I, I will maybe just draw a domain like that. Suppose we have some domain, uh, and uh, suppose we consider some point inside. Well, for a point inside, as I said, for a given edge, uh, we know uh, for our function, we know whether it is uh, proportional to 1 or i or lambda or lambda bar. But for a given vertex, it's just a complex number. And for a given edge, even if you want to say whether it's like plus 1 or minus 1, you don't know because your curve might have turned five times before reaching this point, or seven times, or if it's well inside the domain, one million times. And this is different on the boundary. So if I pick a point on the boundary, say, for example, here, and there is an interface which goes to this point and goes through this point, then it only can turn the same number uh, of times as, the, as does the boundary. So if I look at the piece of the boundary between B and this, this point where I touch, and if I look at this interface between B and this point where I touch, they would have turned the same number of times, just for topological reasons. So essentially, they, they, bound, uh, they bound some piece of a domain. If you go around, then you make a total turn of 360 degrees. So, so if, 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 for example, you begin here in a flat way and then here in a flat way, then what would happen that the uh, to angle at which one turns and the angle at which other turns will have a difference of uh, 360 degrees. But if you, be, if, you, if you start in parallel and end in parallel, they would have exactly the same turn. So one has to on, only to be sure whether one does correctly accounting with this beginning and this end. So whether one loses 90 degrees or loses 270 degrees. But uh, uh, up, to, up to this, it's, it's sort of the same, the same turn. And since it's the same turn, it means that uh, we can calculate complex weight just going along the boundary. So we can just take the tangent vector to the boundary, go and look how it rotates, and we would get complex weight there. And now remember, our weight, it had this spin one half. So whenever we rotate a tangent vector by something, we actually were multiplying by square root of this sum. So when we rotate it by minus 1, we're multiplying by square root of minus 1. So the conclusion is that uh, uh, on the boundary, f of z is proportional to square root of tangent vector. Now I always, it's either tangent vector or 1 over tangent vector. Probably 1 over tangent vector. So what I'm saying now, it's not a proof. It's motivation for the proof to come. It explains why we are going to get what we are going to get. So it's not a proof. It's, it's just an explanation why, why we, 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 we will get certain things in the continuum limit. Because if, if, if I do the proof, it's just it doesn't explain much. But this is essential, essentially the condition. Is it clear what that means? Yeah, I, I, I must say that there are immediately two things which are completely unclear. First, it's unclear what does it mean, what, what, the, what the hell it means on the discrete lattice. Because on the discrete lattice, the tangent vector, it has have only four possible positions, so it's square root only eight possible positions. So what exactly do I mean by this on the 
in the discrete case, it's not clear, and uh, it's absolutely not clear why such discrete problem, if I able to formulate it, would converge to the same continuous problem. So the discrete will formulate it differently. So that, that don't think about this. Now, what does it mean in the continuous setting? It's absolutely clear if domain is smooth. Because if domain is smooth, there is a tangent vector, and square root is well defined because you just trace it from beta, from B to this point, and you, you define it not up to plus minus, but you really define it. Now, why this problem is well defined for any domain? Well, because it's, it's a Riemann problem, it's not a Riemann Hilbert problem. So, a Riemann Hilbert problem would say that f of z minus something is, prob is parallel to this. And that would be difficult to uh, attack, but if it's, there is no minus something, if it's homogeneous, then it changes covariant, covariantly under, under conformal maps. So, what happens with the tangent vector under conformal map? It is just multiplied by the derivative of conformal map, because locally conformal map is, is just multiplication by derivative. So this thing is multiplied by square root of derivative. So this is a problem uh, whose solution behaves like square root of dz form under conformal maps. So Dirichlet problem solution is invariant under conformal maps. It behaves like a function. Its derivative would behave like a dz form because it will be multiplied by phi of z. This behaves like square root of dz form. Okay. And another observation is that uh, uh, what, what would this mean in the, in the continuous setting? So um, if, if you have this, then you can write, well, immediately that f squared of z uh, is parallel to 1 over tau of z. So this is already a simplification because we don't have square roots. And now we can multiply by tau of z, so you can just say that f square of z times tangent vector is parallel to 1. Well, parallel to 1 means that it is real. Now, if you go along the boundary, so if you go along the boundary, then uh, f square dz Along the boundary, dz would be just the tangent vector. So along the boundary, this is purely real. So when you walk along the boundary, this is purely real. So imaginary part does not change. So along the boundary, imaginary part of this guy uh, is constant. So maybe I, I well, it's, it's better maybe to put integral there. So it's along the boundary, uh, primitive of f squared has constant imaginary part. And this is idea for a proof that uh, this is a Dirichlet problem. So if we work. Uh, with integral of f squared, then we are back to Dirichlet problem. And uh, so the idea of the proof work with integral of f squared instead of f. And the difficulty is that it, it works very nicely in the continuous case. If f is an analytic function, f square is an analytic function, integral of f square is an analytic function, so it's just a Dirichlet problem for an analytic function. Now, the problem in our case with the discrete analytic functions is that their squares are no longer discrete analytic. So a priori, even this integral is not defined. It might depend on the path of integration. So we have to do something approximately. We have to to work with this thing as with approximately defined thing, or so th there will be some complications. Fortunately, we see that it, it, won't, it won't be that complicated. Okay. And uh, I only have maybe to remark now what is the continuous solution. We will obtain it later in a different way. But the continuous solution, it should have this property that uh, if we take integral of f squared, then it solves the Dirichlet problem on the boundary. It's constant on the boundary. But there are two exceptions. So it's constant when we go from B to A, or it's constant when we go from A to B, but B and A are exceptional points. So there we might have some jumps. 
So the Dirichlet problem should be that you have constant from A to B, well, say zero, and another constant from B to A, say one. So the, essentially, if, if I define, divide function, define function, sorry, which is one here and zero here and call it H, harmonic function, then uh, another way to define this function would be, uh, so, well, then I would expect that integral of F squared imaginary part is equal to H. But another way to define this H, it it's sort of fits well with this Riemann uniformization map we had for uniform spanning tree, that this H would give me an imaginary part of a mapping to a strip. So if I take this mapping phi, then H is imaginary part of the mapping phi. And since you have two analytic functions, their imaginary part coincides, they, they coincide themselves. Well, up to a constant, but it's a little thing. So essentially, primitive of f squared is phi, f squared is phi prime, and f is square root of phi prime. So this is what we have in continuum. So this, this is what we are supposed to get in the limit. We are supposed to get a square root of derivative of a map to S3. Now, this is a, this is a conformal covariant, uh, so the map, if, if I fix the width of the strip, then the map is unique up to constant plus minus real number. So derivative is unique and square root is unique. Well, yeah, but you just fix it at one point, it's unique up to plus minus. So everything is fine. So the only, the only things we have to worry about is what is the width of the strip. But this will probably get this normalization somewhere in the proof. And, this, uh, and uh, the second thing is, uh, what will be normalization for f? So actually, the normalization which will arise, you will have to divide by square root of, of the lattice mesh, because what we do here, we differentiate. And on the right, we differentiate in continuous setting. On the left, we will differentiate in the discrete setting. So we will have to divide by mesh of the lattice. And then we take square root. So there will be square root of the mesh of the lattice. OK, so is it clear what we are supposed to get in the limit and why? So it's sort of a hand waving why these boundary values well, should, should, should be okay. And also, also note that uh, this square root of phi prime conformal invariant is covariant. So if, if I move, if I map my domain to yet another domain, and I start comparing what would be the difference for this invariance at these two points, how they change by another conformal map, say psi. So they will change by multiplying by square root of psi prime. Because here we have square root of phi prime. Here we would have square root of uh, whatever we call it, say phi 1 prime. And the difference will be square root of psi, pra, psi, psi prime because, well, the diagram is commutative. So this is, this is not, well, so the conformal invariant would be not this, but rather this times square root dz. So this, is, this is, should be treated as a square root of dz form. And this is also the answer why it's called a Fermi on a spinner. So we are dealing with the one half form. Or, well, one quarter, one quarter, if, 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 if you, you can, yeah, one half form, yeah. No, no, here is just one half form, yeah. Uh, OK. So now we are after discrete proof. So is it clear the motivational part? So the, the proof, uh, for the proof, we only have to to define this object. So this is, this is the first thing we want to do. So now the proof. So we want to start, uh, we define by defining H, which is imaginary part of primitive of F squared. Now uh, it turns out uh, that uh, we, we are rather lucky that, uh, in general, as I said, uh, f squared is not an analytic function, so we cannot integrate it. Integral is not unique. It depends on the path of integration. It turns out that for imaginary part, it is unique and is independent of the path of integration. It turns out that the specific weird Cauchy-Riemann equations which we have, they guarantee that f squared is, is, is an exact form. So it, it, so f satisfies two Cauchy-Riemann equations, and f squared still satisfies one of them for some weird reason. So we can integrate imaginary part. So we, take, we can take imaginary part of the integral. We can't, real part of the integral is not well-defined. It depends on the path of integration. But this thing is well-defined. 
So uh, the way we will define it uh, is, 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 so what I'm going to define, I define this, and it's, it's an exercise to check that morally I am indeed defining this. Uh, so what, what, what uh, we will do, well, we have, uh, if you remember, we have two types of squares. So these squares, they were, they were, some of them, they were corresponding to the sites of the original random cluster lattice. And some of them were corresponding to the sites of the dual lattice. So suppose we have, so this is, this is a dual lattice, so suppose there is this uh, square which is, we will call white and this we will call black because it's green. And uh, suppose we have this edge uh, in between which I would denote by E. So there is a number written on this edge, F of E. So what, what I do, we define edge by uh, the following property that H of B minus H of W is equal to absolute value of f of e squared. So it's sort of clear that in a sense, in some sense, h is integral of f squared. Because we are, uh, if, if we want to go from one point to another and calculate h, then each time we are adding or subtracting f squared. But it's, 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 a, it's a bit uh, weird because when we pass from black to white, we add. When we pass in the opposite direction, we subtract. So it's not really clear whether we will move at all because we add, subtract, add, subtract. And also, it depends on the direction. So uh, actually, if one checks carefully what is going on, uh, then uh, one will see that uh, what is going on is what should be going on. So it's, it's indeed we are doing this. But to, 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 to check it, one has to put this weights lambda, lambda bar, and see what does it mean, absolute value of f squared. And since we don't need, I'm not going to do it, but, but it's, it's exactly, we are exactly doing this. So I will just check uh, that this, is, this function is well defined. So the first property is that h is well defined. Actually, I'm not sure that this is a good definition. Maybe when we integrate, maybe we should also multiply by the mesh of the lattice. Maybe that, that would be a good idea. But then I will screw up everything. Should I multiply by the mesh of the lattice? No? Ah, I didn't divide. Yeah, OK, OK. Yeah, no, no, I shouldn't. Yeah, I shouldn't. Thanks. So h is, is well defined. Uh, now, why, why h is well defined? So it's, it's like when we were defining primitive uh, of a function. Here we're defining primitive of f squared. We have to check uh, that, uh, for example, when I go here, uh, well, around these, these different places, if, if I go from here to here, and then from here to there, and then from here to there, and then back, then the sum of increments I get vanishes. Because otherwise, I would get non-trivial mandrum, and the definition will go to pieces. But if I check that it, for every trivial plaquette, it, 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 it vanishes, then I am fine, because it just every contour would be composed of plaquettes. It will be independent of the, of, of the path. Yeah, but it's, it's well defined up, up, to, up to constant, up to plus minus constant. Yeah, and I want to emphasize that h is defined on faces, so f was defined on on edges, h is defined on faces because it's, it's an integral, so we should pass to the dual graph. It sort of makes sense. It, 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 it makes sense. OK. Now, uh, well, let's, let's, let's just check what, what, what happens if we go around this contour. What happens if we write uh, h of b minus h of w? So this is the first, well, h of b minus h of w. So I'm, let's, let's go the other way around. So a plus uh, h of u minus h of b plus h of a minus h of u plus h of w minus h of a. So we want this to sum up to 0. 
And uh, the first thing, so again, I have to label the edges. Let's, let's label them by another color chalk. Let's say, uh, no, that's not visible. OK, that's the H, E. Uh, that's the H, well, let's say E, F, G. You don't see it. The other was better, but I didn't see the other one. And uh, that's the, well, OK, I'll go and search for yet another color. Uh, OK, now I write a third time over the same place, and everyone will stop seeing. <laughs> OK, so that was, do you see it? So this is F, G, and H. Uh, let's say. And uh, what, what we get here is just, uh, uh, well, well, actually the correct one would be north, south, east, and west, uh, but well, it's too late. Uh, so this was f of e squared plus, uh, because there is already e and v. And this uh, is not plus uh, f of h squared, but it's minus f of h squared, because we were passing not from uh, yellow to white, but from white to yellow. So it's the other way around. And here it's again plus f of g squared. And here it's minus f of uh, f squared. But, but you remember that the numbers which we had written around one point, they were projections of this point on real and imaginary axes. And this on lambda and lambda bar. So the two horizontal edges would give us our complex number in one basis, and the two vertical in another basis. So by Pythagoras' theorem, the sum of those two guys, so just by Pythagoras' theorem, is absolute value of f of z squared, where z is the center of this, this whole mess. And by Pythagoras' theorem, these two also give you f of z squared. So it sums up to 0. So H is well defined. So this is actually one thing which, uh, if 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 uh, if we are ever able to do other models, which I I hope uh, uh, someone in this room will, uh, then uh, probably this miracle won't be there. So probably integral of whatever f. First of all, it will be fractional power because the spin for other models is not one half, and then probably what will happen is that. It, one will have to do some approximate complex analysis. One will, have, one will have to sort of do more work. But here, for easing, it's easier. And in principle, here, one can do the job without using this property. If it would be just approximate, one would have had to write some sort of inequality saying that the uh, integral is defined up to area integral of uh, gradient of f squared, etc., etc. So one would have been writing some Sobolev space estimates. So it's not something unsurmountable, at least for domains with nice boundaries. But here, here we are, we are well off. OK, so H is well defined. Is it clear? OK, now uh, the second property is that uh, uh, H is, uh, H is 0 on arc AB. And h is 1 on arc ba. So what I mean is that if I go back to my domain, then h uh, will be equal to 1 on those squares and 0 on those squares, all the, all the way around. So it's 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and, the, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So since h is defined up to uh, additive constant, I have to fix its value somewhere. So I just pick one of those squares and say that it is 0 there. But then I have to prove that it's 0 on all other squares below and 1 on all other squares above. Is the statement OK? So on the first square outside the domain, h is constant along the arc. That's, that's what we have to prove. So the proof starts by saying that H 
is constant along the boundary. So let me just draw a piece of the boundary. So this is one possibility for a piece of the boundary. And uh, I want to show that H is constant, that H is the same at those points. So let's say points P and Q, for example. So the question is whether H of P is equal to H of Q. Now, what is the difference between H of P and Q? Well, we know how to calculate the difference when you jump over an H. So we have to jump over an H twice. So we have to jump to this point. Let's call it R. So uh, we do H of P minus H of R plus H of R minus H of Q. And this will give us the difference H of P minus H of Q. Okay. And now... Uh, what, uh, what gives us those two things? Then a p of r minus r, it will, give, it will be given by, by the value at, on this h. By the value on this h, let's say e, and this is h, say, I don't know, g. And this is f of e squared, and this is f of g squared. But uh, in one of those two cases, we go inside white square. And in another of those two cases, we go outside. So one of those two things will be with plus, another will be with minus. Doesn't matter which, which one is which, but it's either plus minus or minus plus. And what I claim that those two guys coincide, that their absolute values are identically equal. So this is zero. So why is so? It's not a rhetoric question. It's, a <laughs> it's to check that someone was following. Someone not in the last row. Not in the last three rows. <laughs> or the first one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, correct. So if, if we, it's, it's, it's actually we're using this tricky property of the boundary that uh, when we hit the boundary, we know at which angle we hit it. But we use it in rather uh, sort of a perverse way. We don't uh, say that we know exactly how we hit this piece of the boundary, but we know that the way we hit that piece and the way we hit next piece, they differ exactly by lambda. So the absolute values would be the same. So f is exactly the same here and here because only the complex weight is different. If we hit g, we have to follow to e and vice versa. So if, if you're on the street without turns, then you have to follow. Wow because you can't backtrack, so it's, it's indeed zero. And now, um, what happens, so what happens is that uh, if, if I draw my domain here, for example, and this is point B, this is the point B where everything starts, if I set my function zero here, it will be zero here, zero here, and so on and so on, all the way to A. Now, on the other side, it also will be constant. But which constant? I have to determine what is the difference of functions along this h. I have to determine my function on this h emanating from b. But every interface goes out from b. So there is only one way to go in. So uh, if, if this is the h, well, the h b. So here, uh, if, if, if this is p and this is 0, then what we, we get that h of p minus 0, well, minus 0, is equal to what? It's equal to f of b absolute value squared, which is exactly 1, because probability to pass through b is 1. Every interface goes out through b. So the jump here is 1, so we get here 1, 1, 1, 1. So indeed, our function h is what it is supposed to be. It is a function which is integral of f squared in some weird sense, and it's 1 and 0 on the bound. So the only problem is that we want it to be harmonic. If H would have been harmonic, we would, uh, we would be able to just like, go to the swimming pool right away. The cross-section of the graph of, uh, graph of a cross-section of my domain. So if, 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 if I go, uh, so this is uh, 
the bottom part of my domain and this is the top. And then there are two functions. So uh, one, which, which function is smaller? So the yellow function is smaller. So the yellow function is zero here on the, on the bottom part of the domain. So it's, let's say zero or one. And uh, yellow, so what happens is that yellow function has a graph like this and white function has a graph like that. Well, it's so if, if, you, if you take a cross-section of your domain, then at the bottom, yellow function is 0 exactly. And white function is, uh, is a bit bigger, but still very close to 0. On the top, it's the opposite. Y function is 1, and yellow is strictly smaller because when yellow is strictly small by definition, but very close by this property that the difference is small. And then it turns out that there, uh, one is subharmonic and superharmonic. So the subharmonic functions essentially, uh, they super har so superharmonic functions, they are essentially concave. They behave like that. So if you take, say, harmonic function on a line, it's linear. And superharmonic will be like that. And subharmonic will be like this. So it turns out that these two functions, they're actually inside, they're even closer than on the boundary. So they're sort of concave and convex in the good direction. So this, <laughs> this was observed by Dima Chowkak because I, I never checked it. I thought that the world is so depressing as a whole, like with all civil war, wars and all that, that they cannot possibly be closer in the middle that, than, they, than they are on the boundary. So, but more optimistic person checked and turned out that actually the situation is nice. It, it, it saves something in the proof because to estimate the difference, it's enough to estimate it at the boundary. And then inside, they're even closer. So that's a reason to be optimist. Uh, well, no, I don't think it's enough of a reason. But, uh, well, one should be optimist to observe such things. So, uh, okay, so uh, now, so for the white function, Laplacian is positive, and for the yellow function, it's negative. So the second derivative positive means that it's convex, and negative means that it's concave. OK. Now, uh, I don't know. So, uh, so here we come to sort of a dangerous place, because uh, for this, I only know a computation. So I have a hand-waving explanation, which tells you that you can exactly compute and check whether it is positive or negative. And, uh, this hand-waving explanation tells you that it's either this or the other way around. And if it would be the other way around, it would be slightly worse, but still manageable. But if you do the calculation, you see that it's exactly like this. Uh, and for the other property, it's, uh, uh, it's a bit delicate. It's like for uniform spanning theory. Remember this discussion that we have an analytic function and we have boundary values. And then we want to pass to a limit. We need some estimates. And I was saying that, well, we have all the information, so we should do estimates by hand. And uh, for bad domain, it was difficult. And then Wendelin said that, well, OK, we know it comes from uniform spanning tree. We can use more knowledge, and we can do uh, these estimates using the random walk. So here is the same, that uh, this, in principle, this should fall from, uh, from the properties which are on this blackboard. You don't have to appeal to the easing model. And, uh, uh, we have a paper where we do this on the z radio graphs, and on the z radio graphs, uh, not much is known about the Ising model, uh, or at least not much is in the literature. So there, there it's done by hand, so using these properties, and it's rather heavy, so I, I, I don't want to intimidate you. Uh, and uh, for square lattice, it can be done simpler, but even more so for square lattice, we can use the properties of the Ising model, and then it becomes almost trivial. And, uh, the properties of Ising model were folklore since 60 years ago, but fortunately they were recently written up by Jeffrey Grimmett and Svante Janssen, I think. And so there, there were a few papers which, uh, uh, when I posed this question, there were a few good Samaritans who have written it up. So, so it's, uh, it, it's, it, 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 uh, who have written it up needed property of the Ising model. So we will just for simplicity make a reference to the Ising model. So now let's, let's address these two things. Uh, and then, then, we, then we pass to a limit. Okay. So proof. So for the first property is, uh, so let's calculate what is the difference. So uh, h this minus h that, 
at two nearby vertices, by definition, is f at the corresponding h. So we just need to evaluate f at certain h. And f at an h is the probability that interface passes through this h taken with some sign. And if it passes with even number of rotation, then the sign is, say, whatever, lambda. With odd number of rotations, it's minus lambda. So there are lots of constellations. Uh, but we can just write a trivial estimate that this is, at most, probability that this he belongs to the interface. So this very rough estimate, because in fact we, ha we are having constellations, so this, this uh, is uh, much of an overkill. Okay. And now, what is this uh, probability? So this probability, uh, what does it mean that my interface has passed through an HE. Well, you remember the interface was an interface between a cluster and a dual cluster. So there was this uh, dual cluster below, uh, which sort of looks something like that with many holes. But in particular, it goes up to this point, all the way up to this point. And there is also a cluster above, which again goes up to this point. So this was the boundary condition. So this is the cluster. There is only one big cluster which is wired to this arc. And this is the dual cluster. So the anti-cluster. So the fact that we pass through some point actually means that this point is hit by two clusters. So in terms, I mean, if, if, if you, uh, well, that was already mentioned in Pierre Nolan's talk yesterday, or I, I'm sure that it was in Van Sant's course, that uh, it's sort of what is called arms probability. We have a connection by a cluster and connection by a dual cluster to this point. And if the point is in the middle, both of them are unlikely. Either one of them is unlikely. If the point is close to upper boundary, the top connection is unlikely, but the bottom conne the top connection is likely, but bottom is unlikely. If it's here, it's vice versa. The cluster is unlikely to reach, but anti-cluster is likely. But two of them are always unlikely. Well, unless uh, it's, it's slightly different near these uh, points, near, near the end points, there you should sort of, uh, you should fix your distance from the end points. You should say the distance is bigger than certain epsilon, and then you can write estimates. So, so it's clear that these two things are unlikely, and actually what, what, what uh, we observe, what is the probability that two points are connected in a random cluster model. It's the same as magnetization in the spin easing model. So essentially, the, the estimate we want that magnetization at critical temperature is very small. And that was uh, essentially calculated by Young in 1952. So he calculated if the boundary values are O plus, what would be magnetization at the center? That it, it is n to the power minus 1 over 8, where n is the size of the box. Uh, and uh, we need a much, much weaker statement that just it tends to zero with the size of the box. So when we put small and smaller mesh, it tends to zero. And so this, so this is a, at most, well, it just tends to zero. So can I leave it at that? I, have, I think it's, it's probably best. But in principle, you can deduce it from other properties, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it, gets, it gets a bit boring then. OK. Now then. Uh, for the other two properties, well, I have to convince you that we can write some formula for this guy. I'm not sure uh, you want me to write the formula. Well, I can, of course. Well, OK. So uh, let me maybe just try to see how this works. So suppose I want to evaluate. Uh, Suppose I want to evaluate, uh, so this, let's say, those are yellow squares. So I want to evaluate Laplacian. What was Laplacian? Laplacian was uh, uh, here at this point. You sum the nearby squares, and you subtract 4 times this square. So I have to write uh, what is the sum of the differences like that of my function of my function h. 
And by the way, it's, it's clear that if I get Laplacian positive on yellow squares, I will get it negative on white squares. Why? Because there is this anti-symmetry. When you go from yellow to white, you add f squared. And otherwise, you subtract f squared. So if I do some calculation for yellow squares and it yields a positive result, for white squares, it should yield a negative result because all the formula I am multiplied by minus 1. So it's sort of immediately clear that if I get result for yellow squares, the result for white squares would be opposite. So this is the reason for this funny picture. OK, so I have to decide in terms of which variables do I want to write these uh, h things. So uh, let me maybe just uh, assume that uh, I have numbers here which are, let's say, b at this point uh, and i d at this point and lambda bar c here and lambda a here. So these are values of f at these four edges. Sorry? You don't see it? Well, OK. Ah, you told me already. Yeah, that's sorry. Now where I can't see the piece of chalk which you can see, so <laughs> that's. Uh, uh, well, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, we just put uh, this. This is OK? No. Yellow one. OK. OK. So ID uh, B lambda C lambda A lambda bar. So this I just wrote to have real numbers A, B, C, D. Uh, and uh, if I am able to write what I want to write in terms of those guys, uh, I would know for sure whether Laplacian is positive or negative. Why? Because values of f on these edges, they are essentially independent. There is no relation between them. So these two nearby edges are independent because you remember that the four edges from one vertex, they were two relations, but you can pick any two edges and they're independent. And this is also independent. You can easily just play around to see that you can change your domain. You can get essentially any numbers in these four places. So those are four independent numbers values of f. So if I write something in terms of them, they're like independent variables. And the formula I get, you, I can get any possible outcome which is allowed by this formula. So if, if I'm going to get something positive, I would see it because I it, it, it should be then just a quadratic form or something. OK, and uh, now what happens here is that uh, so first observation is that I actually can calculate what are the values of f at nearby places. Why I can? Because, for example, for this vertex, I know value of f on two nearby edges. And what does it mean? If this is the point z, f of z has real part b and has projection of lambda bar equal to c. So if I know two projections of a complex number, I can write all the other projections. So I can write those two projections in terms of b and c. I can write those two projections in terms of a and b. I can write those two in terms of a and d, those two in terms of d and c. So I can just fill all the edges in this diagram. Now to know the increment of h along this root, I need to add b squared and then subtract whatever is written on this h. And that I can write in terms of b and c. So this is an explanation that I can write in terms of a, b, c, and d, the Laplacian of h. And the answer obviously will be rotationally symmetric. It will be symmetric by rotating and multiplying by lambda. So if I rotate like that and multiply by lambda so that what is on top becomes real, uh, always, then I, I should have the same, the same answer. And the answer also is a quadratic form because I add b squared here, I add another square here. So if you think a little bit, the answer will be a quadratic form in a, b, c, d. It will have some rotational invariance properties. So essentially what, what you can get, you can get, uh, I think the, on, the, the, on, the only possible uh, way, th the only possible thing to get would, would be some specific sum to the square, either with plus sign or minus sign. And actually one gets it. So I don't know whether, I'm not sure it's a good idea to do the calculation, honestly. So what, uh, maybe I'll write the result of the calculation. 
Uh, so uh, if this point is W, if these two points are W, then uh, the result is uh, that uh, Laplacian, so, well, calculate. And then what you get, uh, well, as I said, you can write everything in terms of F here and F here, because they give you B, C, and A, and Z. And you get that the Laplacian at this center of H is actually equal to F of Z minus F of W absolute value squared. And then the sign is plus or minus, depending on whether you are dealing with yellow square or white square. And there is also a coefficient, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, is it square root of two or something? Yeah, it does matter. Well, what it gives you, it gives you, there is some number there. I, thi I think it's the number is square root of 2 or, or some real multiple of it. So it's, it's either 1 or square root of 2 or 1 over square root of 2 or, or a square of square root of 2. Or, you know, there is this Littlewood convention in analysis which says that you write all the identities up to a multiple constant, which is a factor of 2 pi and i in some powers. So uh, you, well, this is the power of two. Uh, okay, uh, well, so I'm not, uh, so it's plus for yellow vertices and minus four, so it's, it's plus and it's minus four for yellow vertices. And it's, it's square root of some, some other funny number. Uh, okay, actually here it's written that the exercise is to show that it's true without a square root. But it's, as, as I said, I took the wrong notes. You know, the constant is time dependent. It's actually growing with the expansion of the universe. <laughs> Three years ago, it was one, and now it's square root of two. Uh, OK. OK, now we are, we are set up uh, to prove the convergence, because essentially, we are just as good as in the current friedrichs levy statement. Because look, uh, we have two functions. Uh, which are subharmonic and superharmonic. And that means that uh, if I take harmonic function, it will be squeezed in between. So one can concord a harmonic function squeezed in between those two. And, uh, or for example, you can just, but it doesn't really matter, you can take harmonic function with the same values as the yellow one. And then it will be also we're always very close to the white one, or you can find the harmonic function which, we, which is in between. But basically, what we have, we have two functions. And one is subharmonic, and another one is superharmonic. And they're epsilon close. And they have boundary values approximately 1, approximately 0. And since there is both a subharmonic and superharmonic, you can find the harmonic close one to them, and you can use current friedrichs levy theory. So perhaps the best, the best way to do it so let me erase whatever remains of the proof. So now the, we can do convergence of H. Uh, so uh, Yeah, for, exa for example, just, just, take, uh, uh, just take another function, let's say h equal to h white on the boundary, and harmonic. So we take, uh, let, let me denote it by yet another color. Is it a good color? So we take a function which is harmonic, so, so it goes something like this. So this function is clearly... So this function h white is small or equal than this new function for which I lost the color h, which is in turn, uh, well, it's not uh, smaller than the yellow function, but if we move yellow function a little bit up by small epsilon, which is their difference, so we have to move it, so let's say this is the difference, deno let's denote it by delta. So it's at most h plus delta, where delta is the supremum of, of the difference of white function and yellow function.
And this is just because by subharmonicity, because subharmonic function is smaller than harmonic, and superharmonic is bigger than harmonic if they have uh, bounded harmonic, if, if the boundary value satisfies this. So now what we have, uh, we essentially we have a harmonic function. Its boundary values are approximately 0 and 1. So this, by current Friedrichs Levy theorem, converges in the scaling limit. It converges to the small function, to the function h small, which is uh, continuously harmonic. So it's h small is continuously harmonic in continuous domain, and it's equal to 1 or 0 on the boundary. So it's on AB, on BA. So this function, the new function, converges. But the two other functions, they're epsilon close to it. So they also converge. And the deep, because they hear the differences at most delta difference between. So between these two differences are small and between these two is small. So the, all the differences are small than delta. So everything converges. So the conclusion is that H white and H yellow, they both converge to H small. Uh, well, that that uh, essentially that means well. Okay, uh, I I was a bit sketchy. So what what uh, I mean? I mean, first of all, I mean that uh, my function, which is defined on the lattice, I continue to the whole domain by just piecewise linear on the on the faces or piecewise constant on the faces. And since I have uh, somewhere this statement that the difference of two nearby values is small. It, it doesn't, it changes, but pi plus minus something very small. And this everywhere inside the domain converges. In some sense, it's even better. It converges uniformly apart from neighborhood of B and neighborhood of A. So it converges uniformly apart from neighborhood of B and A. So let me maybe indeed put it here. So it's uniform convergence away from A and B. And, uh, uh, well, because near the boundary are also okay, because near the upper boundary it's almost equal to 1, so it's... And here, here actually, actually, here it's also... Um, there is this issue how you discretize the domains. In principle, here there is lots of freedom how you discretize the domain, because the solution to this Dirichlet problem is conformally invariant. So when you do discretization, you can do like house door discretization, something which is discrete and has boundary very close. But it's enough for it to be close in some sort of conformal metric. So that they say conformal maps to two domains are close. So in some very weak sense of being close is enough, in a sense. Okay. Okay, is it fine? So now, now we pass to the convergence of F. And uh, of course time flies faster than I think. Always, but uh, okay. So now we pass to the convergence of F. So here it's it's a bit tricky because uh, what is F? F is a derivative of H. Well, uh, I mean, current friedrichs levy theorem says that. We can differentiate harmonic functions, and derivatives would converge. But here, we have a function which is approximately harmonic. So it's not clear whether derivatives should converge or not. But we can just replicate the proof of the doge of current Friedrichs and Levy. So what we do, we write some sort of a, well, one can write, for example, some sort of an integral representation for, for the function f okay so let's just erase everything so if the full board was enough for one hour then half board should be enough for half an hour probably <laughs> okay now
maybe I don't even want to to go into this business that f convergence. I want to skip to SLE convergence. So, uh, so okay. So conclusion. So so far, what we have, we have that the function h converges to function h small, and that's imaginary part of the map phi inside. Well, just in omega, in omega away from a and b. Now, uh, what we would uh, want to do uh, Ah, I have five minutes, not half an hour. Wait a second. I thought I have 35 minutes. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, okay. So, I, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> okay, then I, then I will go very, very fast. So, I, I will just explain. <laughs> I will just explain. Well, I will convince you that it should be true. Uh, so, um, Yeah, okay, so I mean, in principle, we have really, I, 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 I should just convince you that there is an overqueuing information to, to deduce that H is not exactly harmonic, so we can't appeal to current Friedrich Levy, but it's, it's not, not, not a big problem. Uh, so, uh, first of all, you observe, uh, which, which I did that, uh, in the beginning, uh, well, I said uh, that one should check, you observe that indeed uh, F is. Uh, uh, is uh, inter so indeed h is integral of imaginary part of f, and it turns out that uh, it's it it is true. So uh, if we uh, so we had this funny formula when we are going to the square of a different color, but the formula was funny because we are going to a square of different color and they are different. If instead you go you hop twice and you end up in a square of the same color, then everything starts making sense. So everything perfectly agrees. So if uh, you have this point Z and you have two squares of the same color, let's say uh, X and Y, then the observation is that uh, uh, H so what was uh, what was it? H of y minus H of x is it's indeed imaginary part of f of z squared, but we should do dz in this direction. So we should multiply by the vector y minus x. Well. So maybe it's yeah. What what's so so it's uh, so let's say just let's put it d z by d z I denote this vector. So d z is this yellow vector. So I denote it by d z. So if we indeed integrate f square in this direction, then this is exactly the formula we get. And of course, uh, so it's it's again by in little would sense. So there is there is a factor in front which is some multiple of two. Uh, I think it's square root of two. Is it square root of two or no? No one knows. Yeah, I, I think there is square root of two here, but it's 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 not it's not really that important. So it's it's up perhaps perhaps a square root of two here. Okay. So so uh, so this is so if we hope. Across a vertex, this is indeed what we do. We indeed integrate imaginary part of f squared dz. Now, uh, what we can do, we first, we know lots of estimates on h, lots of estimates on f. So, for example, we, we know that uh, uh, h, uh, Laplacian of h uh, is equal to gradient of f squared. We know that h is subharmonic, so Laplacian of h, when we integrate, it gives us some bounded thing. 
So when we integrate gradient of f squared, it gives some bound thing. So it's fairly easy to get a priori estimates that way f is uh, in some sense bounded and nice. So it's in some good space. So we can choose, uh, we can choose subsequence. Well, let's say epsilon j such that f epsilon j properly normalized converges to something. So it's f epsilon j converges to some f small. Now, uh, what, what one has to do here, one has, of course, to put 1 over square root of epsilon j because, uh, I mean, this, this says that it's not exactly f squared because we, we, don't, we, just, we multiply by this direction but not, not by the length of this interval. So if we multiply by length of this interval, then we would uh, get an integral. So it's, it's uh, uh, so we, we, ha we, have, we have to put, uh, we have to put this normal normalizing constant here. Uh, and, uh, well, h, we know that h epsilon j converges to h. And uh, so what we need to check that uh, integral of h is equal to, uh, sorry, integral of imaginary part of f squared is equal to h. And this is true because h epsilon j converges to h and uh, f epsilon converges to this uh, and h epsilon j is equal to what? It's equal to the, to the, su to the integral by discrete, so the sum of things like imaginary part of f epsilon j squared. And this would converge to that. And the only difference, what, 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 why it doesn't converge, uh, because here we have a Riemann sum, but we didn't put the lengths of intervals in. We just, when we hop across the vertex, we just add f squared. So this would converge to that if we would multiply by epsilon j. So if, if, if we divide this by, by epsilon j, uh, well, okay, 1 over epsilon j, then this would converge to that. And hence, these two things, these two things would, be, would be equal. So this, this is sort of a trick that we want to prove. Uh, we don't have to work with the derivative of h. We can work with the integral of f. And the integrals of f we can work with because uh, because we have some uniform convergence. And then once we have this, uh, we also obtain that uh, this thing, uh, so f is exactly holomorphic, and then we also obtain that, uh, well, f uh, squared is h prime, well, okay, that, that's imaginary part of phi, so this implies that f squared is uh, it implies that uh, imaginary part of f squared is h. Uh, well, maybe it's but f squared uh, is, uh, well, integral of f squared is phi. Uh, f squared is phi prime. And f is square root of phi prime. And we are done because this, this is the limiting thing of what we need. Yeah, so he, here, here there is no idea after what was done whatsoever, except that we don't need to differentiate, we can integrate. Instead of proving that convergence of H implies that its derivative convergence converges, we just assume that uh, F converges because we have enough estimates for precompactness. And then we show that integral of F is H, so F indeed integral of limit of F is limit of H. And we, we are done. Questions? I got everyone intimidated. Not yet. So uh, uh, now, uh, yes. Oh no, no. I mean, uh, you see, uh, you see this property. For example, uh, I wrote. Oh gosh, I erased it. Uh, well, I wrote. I wrote this that uh, this thing is absolute value of gradient of f squared. So there was this property. And you see, if, if you have a function like this, which is subharmonic and doesn't oscillate much, 
its repression doesn't integrate too much because you are just integrating over some very very shallow point or very very low hill so the Sobolev norm of f is very small no it's it's, it's a huge overkill here we we know know too much information so it's in, in, in a sense, from here, here, it's, it's, you don't need any Sobolev inequality or something. It's, 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 it's fair, fair, fairly easy. Okay, so now, now uh, let's, let's just decide what we do tomorrow. Uh, so uh, one, one thing, uh, so I, I, I can just do a little calculation that this implies that uh, interface converges to SLE. Uh, which implies that uh, driving function of the interface converges to the driving function of SLE, but to do that it converges as a curve, it requires more harder work, so that I'm not going to do. Then I can do similar observ for the spin model. So I'll show that it satisfies similar equations, but with slightly different boundary conditions, and do, and do some hand waving. And then, um, time permitting, I can also say how a silly kappa kappa minus six arises in the fk easing model so this is not still not written work but uh, it sort of nicely explains why so a silly kappa kappa minus six was mentioned here ah no okay so i can explain how it arises naturally time permitting now okay so there are two things which i'm certain to do i will i will explain why this observable gives us a silly and i will explain how a similar observable arises in spin model are, are there any strong desires that I do something specific and different? No? Okay. So can I say one more thing in, in like two, three minutes, five minutes? Because I, I, I forgot yesterday to say, and a uh, couple of people asked me about, uh, uh, about the Gaussian free field convergence and the complex measure. So the complex measure is mysterious, so I cannot tell you. But there is another trick which makes it real. So you remember that there was this uh, complex measure trick of Baxter. So let's say Baxter. He had a weight of uh, mu uh, for such uh, loop and mu bar for the opposite loop. I think I denote it probably by exponential of i theta uh, and uh, let's write in big letters. Uh, and uh, let's say mu bar exponential of minus i theta. And we were saying that there is this projection to real model where you forget orientations of the loops. There is another projection also to a real model where you forget connections between the contours. So there are two projections to real models which are very different. And uh, the second projection is projection to the so-called six vertex model. So let, let me just briefly outline it. So our model, uh, original model, was a model of loops like this. And then we, put, uh, then we put arrows on them. So we have pictures of arrows, which would look something like that. OK? And the projection, it's, it's a real projection. Now there is another projection. We can leave all the arrows, but forget about the loops. So I can draw you a picture like this. It's not, not too small what I'm drawing. Is it, is it OK, or should I draw bigger? So a model where you draw such things is called a six-vertex model. Why is it called a six-vertex model? Because there are six possibilities how to draw connections around one vertex. So one property which we have here with the connections that for every vertex there are two connections incoming and two outgoing. And there are six ways to do it. So essentially there are, there are, two, uh, twi there are two vertices of this type. And there are four vertices of this type. Okay, and that's called six vertex model. When there are six different vertices, you assign to them probabilities a1, a2. Well, it's a usually u1, u2, u3, u4, and v1, v2. And uh, sometimes you also do things or sources where there are outgoing only, and then it's called eight vertex model. Okay, so what I claim that projection to this model is also a real projection. So measure becomes real again. 
And the reason is that uh, this picture can be written in two different ways, as a, is in one different way, as a picture of cycles. And this one can be written in two different ways. So this one can be written either like that or like this. Now, what is the weight of this picture? You remember, left turn had a weight lambda, and right turn had weight lambda bar. So this picture has one left turn, one right turn. So what is the weight of this picture? One. Now, what is the weight of this picture? There are two turns to the right. So the weight is lambda bar squared. And these two turns to the left. What is the weight? Lambda squared. Now, if I add them up, what I get is lambda squared plus lambda bar squared, which is a real number. So if I project, uh, it's, and it's actually even positive, uh, because if you, you can choose lambda such that it is positive. So it turns out that the weight of any vertex is, so there are, four types of vertices which have weight 1, and there are two types which have weight lambda squared plus lambda bar squared. So again, there is a real weight, but you remember I was telling about height function. For height function, for this sort of geographic landscape, I don't know to make this connection. It's enough to put this picture and I will reconstruct the geographic landscape. So the geographic landscape alone, it's perfectly reconstructable, and you get a real statement that there is a real object, a random height function, it should convert to free field and everything is fine. And it also converges to the same free field, but the interfaces converge to different SLEs. And the reason is that in this picture you don't see the interfaces. We forgot the interfaces, how they are connected. And once we try to introduce to this picture connections, we have to introduce complex weights. And then we, we, it's, it's, it's like in Scott's talk, we introduce this sort of oblique turns, and this, this gives you the interface. So this is a very, very good conjecture. Take six vertex model. Take this model. Uh, and the weight, there are two types of vertices. One has weight one, another has some other weight, uh, lambda squared plus lambda bar squared, say, denoted by u. Uh, and uh, u is just some number. And depending on the way, and, and then you get in the limit uh, Gaussian free field as a, of a height function. Now everyone goes and tries to prove it. Everyone. <laughs> you too. <laughs> no, no, you should, you should, well, unfortunately, physicists already, already explained it. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, well, okay, physicists are free, mathematicians go and prove it. <laughs> Questions? I think that's it then. Yeah.